Welcome back. We are continuing in chapter 7 and today we look at 7.3 integrating functions with discontinuities. Previously we looked at 7.2 where we learned what does it mean for a function to be integrable and we know in particular that continuous functions are integrable. So let's look at functions that are not continuous. What about functions with discontinuities? Can they be integrable? We begin with maybe the simplest example, a function that is discontinuous just at one point. So this function looks like basically a value of 1 all the way across, but just at the one point uh, when x is 1, that's when it has a value of 0. So let's prove that this function is integrable. Now, what do we need to do in order to show that a function is integrable? Given an epsilon greater than 0, we must find a partition so that the upper sum of the function over the partition minus the lower sum of the function over the partition is less than epsilon. So how do I find such a partition? First, we note that the upper sum for any partition is going to be 2. Do you remember how the upper sum was defined? So k equals 1 to n, I'm summing over all the partitions, and I'll take the maximum value of the function in the partition times the width of the partition, x sub k minus x sub k minus 1. So the maximum height times the width. And in my interval, no matter what kind of partition I take, see so I'll just make a bunch of lines here imagining a partition, in every partition the highest value that I get will always be 1. So this capital M just becomes 1, and I'm left with what? The sum of the widths. So the sum of all the widths will give me 2 altogether. So this is why that for every partition P the upper sum is always 2. So now let's turn our attention to the lower sum. Consider this particular partition. So it only has four points. Zero, so I'll draw zero there. One minus epsilon over three. So something just a little bit to the left of one. One plus epsilon over three. So just a little bit to the right of one. And then finally two. This is a partition with three subintervals. Now, I'll calculate the lower sum of the function over this uh, partition, and it's the summation, um, I guess in this case, k goes from 1 to 3. Uh, the smallest value on the partition times the width of the partition. And in my first subinterval, the smallest value is 1. The function value is constantly 1 there, uh, times the width. In my second subinterval, the smallest value is 0, and in the third uh, subinterval, uh, it's up to 1 again. And when I simplify that expression, I end up with 2 minus 2 times epsilon over 3. That's the lower sum, so finally I need to take upper minus lower, and it turns out to be a number that is less than epsilon. And so there we did it. Uh, I found a particular uh, partition so that the upper sum minus the lower sum was less than epsilon. So that shows me that, yes indeed, this function is integrable. Now let's turn our attention to finitely many discontinuities. And so we call, I call this uh, theorem 7.3.2-ish. If you look at the in the book, the theorem 732 is actually quite a bit different for, from what I'm presenting, but they are, sort of try to give it the same effect. Ultimately, what, what they're trying to say is that if a function has finitely many discontinuities, then it's still integrable. So we can actually prove this, this whole statement all at once. So let's give this a try. The idea is really that we're going to look at the proof for one discontinuity and just generalize it a little bit. Same basic idea. Um, since f is bounded, there's some capital M, so the absolute value f of x is less than M for all x in my interval. Okay, so we're going to use that capital M at some point. And there are finitely many discontinuities. Let's call that t. Suppose that there are t discontinuities, and we'll call those x values d1, d2, d3, all the way up to dt. And just to make things a little bit easier for us, let's assume that 
uh, these points are interior points. So D1 is not A, and DT is not actually B. Now let epsilon greater than zero be given. Remember, even before I go any further, what's my goal? I want to find a partition where the upper sum minus the lower sum is less than epsilon. So let epsilon greater than zero be given. Around each D sub I, consider the points D sub I plus or minus this thing. And it's, it's, it's a valid question to ask, how in the world did you come up with that? And I'll just say, wait, it'll work out. So, but to see that I really can make it. Uh, M is a constant, T is a constant, epsilon was given to me, so I can um, choose uh, points DI plus or minus epsilon over 8MT. So that's just a little bit to the left of D1 and a little bit to the right. And just a little bit to the left of D2 and just a little bit to the right. Just a little bit to the left of D3 and just a little bit to the right. Uh, it is worth noting, we're going to need this soon, the width of each of these subintervals is the same, and the width is epsilon over 4mt. All right, so uh, I've made points around each of the discontinuities. Now, let's create partitions p1 through pt plus 1 between these. So there's some partition p1 that is before the first discontinuity, and then some partition p2, which is a set of x values between that, and then p3, and then p sub 4. And partitions use both the left and the right endpoints. So these points that I included earlier are actually endpoints in my new partitions, p1, p2, p3, p4. Incidentally, we'll just note that if there are t discontinuities, then there are t plus 1 partitions. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not done with my sentence. Actually, I can create these partitions, p1 through p t plus 1, so that for each p sub i, uh, the upper sum minus the lower sum is less than epsilon over 2t plus 1. And again, yes, I can, I can do that, and we'll see why this particular number is useful uh, in, in a minute. Um, why can I do that? I can do this because the function is integrable between its discontinuities. <laughs> between its discontinuities, it is continuous, and it's, if it's continuous, then it is integrable. So I can make these p1, p2, p3, p4, I can make the difference in the upper sum and the lower sum as small as I want. So I'm going to choose that for each partition, it is the upper sum minus lower sum is less than epsilon over 2 times t plus 1. All right, so this is the setup, and let's see what kind of benefit that this gives us. Now, here is the partition that is going to bring it home for us. I'm going to make partition q, that is the union of all those p's that I described earlier. And let's figure out upper sum minus lower sum of partition q. So upper sum, and I claim that this is going to be less than epsilon. So the upper sum minus the lower sum of that partition q. Well, first of all, I can take all the upper sums minus lower sums of the p1, p2, p3, p4. But I'm missing the subintervals over the discontinuities. So I also have to include the summation of uh, max minus min over those um, over those t discontinuities. Uh, so it's the difference in the heights times the interval width. Okay. But notice this. By the design of my partitions p1 through pt t plus 1, I know that upper minus lower is less than epsilon over 2 t plus 1. So that can be summed t plus 1 times. And here, this is an interesting point, this difference, the maximum function value minus the minimum function value, well, I can use the fact that that is going to be less than 2m because my function is bounded. The absolute value of my function is never more than m. So the most extreme that I could ever have in terms of my y values would be 2m.
But also, look what happens in this expression. My 2m cancels with the 4m down below, and so my whole summand here becomes epsilon over 2t. Now what happens when I actually sum these? There, in both cases I'm summing constants, and I should write this is i goes from 1 to t plus 1, and in the right it's i equals 1 to t, and by summing constants I just end up with epsilon over 2 in the first term, epsilon over 2 in the second term, and that equals epsilon. And there I've done it. I have found a partition where the upper sum minus the lower sum is less than epsilon. So yes, a function with finitely many discontinuities is in fact integrable. Can a function with infinitely many discontinuities be integrable? And the answer is yes and no. Consider uh, Tomei's function. It turns out that Tomei's function is integrable. Tomei's function, you might remember, has this crazy property that it is continuous at every irrational number and it is discontinuous at every rational number. Yes, I mean this has an infinite number, a, a countably infinite number of discontinuities. And in fact the discontinuities uh, are, are dense, the rational numbers are dense. And yet this function is still integrable. Uh, it'll be part of the homework problems to actually go through a few steps and show that this is so. On the other hand, Dirichlet's function is not integrable. Let's see why this should be. Uh, well, for any partition p, so let me just imagine I make a partition of the interval from a to b, so it has some wide parts, some skinny parts. The lower sum of g is 0, because I guess any interval has some irrational numbers in it, and for the irrational numbers the value is going to be 0. All right. What about the upper sum? Is the upper sum, it claims it's b minus a, why should that be? Remember, upper sum k equals 1 to n of the maximum value times the interval width x sub k minus x sub k minus 1. Oh, but in our case here, every subinterval contains a rational number, because rational numbers are dense, and so every subinterval has a function value that is 1. So this m sub k in every case is 1. 1. And so this sum actually just ends up adding together the uh, all the widths of the subintervals. And that goes all the way from a to b, so I get b minus a as my upper sum. Now, 0, b minus a, those two will never meet. For any partition, those are the two different values of my upper sums and lower sums. I cannot make them within epsilon of each other. So Dirichlet's function is not integrable. It turns out that any bounded f over the closed interval from a to b with countably many discontinuities is integrable. So um, we won't prove that, but I just wanted to put it out there as kind of an interesting fact about integrals. And that brings us to the homework section. A very simple homework, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, I'm not even modifying them or making notes. Give those things a try and ask me if you have questions. Good luck.